But what made you really a real ambassador of cultural diplomacy? Because when you arrived, Marcia, you made this very beautiful sentence um, openly in front of us. I'm here because I care. Mm. And it's a beautiful way to say that you're a great musician, a great singer, traveled all over the world, and you care. That's why you are here. Yes. So what did you really mean on that? I love humanity. And I like when all people are treated like human beings. Doesn't matter where they're from or where they're born and what color of the skin. And I feel very disturbed when I see disturbing things. And that's what actually I meant, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gillen, I was not sure whether it's Gillen or Gillen. I'm sorry, I know it's Gillen, but first I was <laughs> wrong. Um, you're not only a singer and a musician, but you fund some causes, what you are supporting uh, in your life. For example, you are very strongly related to Armenia. So how did it start? How did it happen? How did you uh, find this cause? Because it has been going on for quite a while, working with them. Well, I was in, uh, I, I, I was in uh, Armenia doing a concert in 1990, and uh, doing five shows actually, and I was, it was just after the incredible earthquake with the epicenter in, in Spitak and Gyumri, uh, which killed 25,000 people and made 20, a quarter of a million people homeless. And I was there one year after it had taken place, and I saw many things. The, 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 the town hall clock was still stopped at 20 to 12. But I think the thing that most um, the, the, is still emblazed in the back of my mind is being introduced to an old lady who had lost her home, and she showed me the family portrait. And she was there with 28 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and she was the only one still alive. And, and she was numb. And the mayor of uh, Spitak told me that there had been no music, of course, for a year in the church, in the school, on the radio, and it seemed even as if the birds had stopped singing. Mm -hmm. And so we did uh, a benefit at the time, but it was one of those things where you're throwing money <clears throat> into a, a general cause with no idea how it's being spent or whatever. It's just an overwhelming outpouring of, of um, empathy with the contributors. Mm -hmm. And so still nothing happened. I went back many years later to be, receive an award from the president and I was very honored, but still nothing had been done. Um, generally speaking, in terms of spiritual renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to, because of this idea of the music having stopped a generation, generation later, we decided to build, rebuild the music school. Mm -hmm. And in the two years, we've managed to raise enough money uh, to do that. And a generation later, I'm pleased to say, construction started about four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be completed next September when we're going to be at the opening ceremony. It's taken all these years to get it absolutely finalized, but it's so worthwhile because it's symbolic, the music is symbolic of Renaissance. And, uh, you know, we all do things because we're lucky to be able to do them. Mm. I've got friends who are sportsmen and they're lucky to, to be able to come and play a bit of music. I've been lucky enough to play with George Best and lots of people like that. I'm no good as a footballer, but it's wonderful and people like to come along and pay money to see it and have a good time. So. It's, uh, we're in a very privileged position to be able to do something like this. And occasionally you get to see a project come to absolute fruition. And so, yeah, I, I feel wonderful about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hey. Actually, Yerevan is this year's UNESCO's World Capital of Book. Actually, uh, yes, I'm just <laughs> telling you, uh, we were there uh, to open this uh, amazing uh, uh, festival and the culture is so strong there and they preserve it so strongly so uh, no one can be untouched no. by that kind of uh, no. preservation obviously no, yes um, I was thinking um, for us I mean sitting in the audience listening to your songs yeah. uh, it's just a privilege and of course when we were younger we were dancing <laughs> with you all the time and uh, it's just fun but Obviously, it starts probably with 
also enjoying that kind of fun yourself. But then it comes a point when you must feel really the responsibility that you are not only giving fun to the people, but you are influencing them strongly and deeply. Because that's the strength, really, of art. That you, it's first you do it for yourself, but actually you are influencing the people. Do you remember when you felt that actually whenever you spoke, whenever you sang, when whatever you did, you could become a role model, you, there you had followers, you were able to change the lives of many people? Because that's really a very strong element of being a well-known artist. Well, I have heard several stories and uh, they're always really very positive stories that, um, oh, I could go on and on, but it would take too long. <laughs> but one, I do think, one. I do think that yeah. um, uh, Boniem's music, simple songs, happy songs, that people really enjoyed singing and, you know, going crazy party and having fun, did something to the first generation and then the that generation passed it on to the second generation. And even young people now are in the audiences because the grandparents told them about OEM. And then they listen. And some little boys, like for example, one of my backup vocalists, she has two little boys, one three, one two. And one of the, them call themselves Daddy Cool One, and the other one is Daddy Cool Two. <laughs> which is so sweet. And she told me one day she was rehearsing. <laughs> she told me one day she was rehearsing and um, she stopped the, the, you know, the, you know, daddy cool and because she had to come on, on the road with me and she stopped the music and that child cried, no, no, put the music back on, put it back on. And that's a two or three year old. So what do you, I think it is very influential, which is very nice. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the general conference last year in UNESCO, because I always go back to my family, of course, um, under my presidency decided to create the International Day of Jazz, which is a new thing. Mm -hmm. So from this year, we celebrate all over the world the International Day of Jazz. Oh. And of course, jazz as a music, as a genre, is fantastic. But of course, we decided about that because jazz is a symbol I was brought up behind the Iron Curtain, and I remember very well there were amazing jazz musicians who were banned, who couldn't play. It was not possible for them, you know, to record or uh, them to play, for example, in radio, and we were following them into little locales and so on. So why I am saying that, that of course jazz is a very strong message about freedom, uh, but the same is rock. Rock music has always has a statement. There is something behind the notes which are telling a message, a story to the audience. Um, your decision becoming a rock musician, was it deliberate or was it because of the times? Well, the ethos of rock music as, it's, as it became called <coughs> was basically theft. We, we were influenced by lots of different kinds of music as kids, but we'd always try and steal the guitar player from the band around the corner because he had a better amplifier or he was a better blues player or because <laughs> of this and that and the other. And we went through our formative years and we learned our craft and we learned how to, our stage craft and our recording craft and our songwriting craft and all that sort of thing. And everyone could do that. It's not difficult. You just apply yourself but then it's a, it's a combination of luck and personalities being put together and chemistry. And we were lucky enough to have people like John Lord and Richie Blackmore and Roger Glover and Ian Pace. And so the influences were that of orchestral composition, blues, soul music, big band swing, rock and roll, folk, as many as you could imagine. And that fused into what we managed to do in the back room. And it became our speaking voice, our musical voice. So that became rock. And then, of course, it was coincidental with um, a, a real outpouring of other elements of music. The Beatles had made it possible for artists to write their own material. I mean, I don't mean jazz artists, I mean pop mm. artists. Yeah. Because you were never allowed to do that. The record company would mm. never allow you to do that in the early days. So we could write our own material and we could be more expressive musically. 
And people like Jim Marshall, who ran the music shop around the corner from where I lived, had a friend called Ken Flegg, who was an engineer, and he started making big amplifiers. So, and we started playing in bigger places, and so things got louder and bigger. And so people paid more attention to the volume, I think, and the, and the, and the audience participation than they did to actually what was happening at the time. But it was very interesting to see how it evolved. We became rock musicians by accident. It was purely by circumstances. And it's rather like the way a conversation might go around a table with different groups of friends who have different interests and different backgrounds. Mm. They might focus on this, that, or the other. And it was as simple as that. Mm. Not complicated. Not yeah. complicated. <laughs> you just needed a good voice for that, for example, to start with. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Don't talk about that. <laughs> what makes you angry today? Nothing. Fantastic, really. Nothing. Why? How can I, you do that? You, you, because, you know, um, life is short. And don't forget, I have battled for my life for so many years that I think um, it is not necessary to worry about a thing. Just look forward, push on through, and thank God that I'm healthy, I can perform, I can sing, I can give love. And that's about it. Um, at UNESCO, we have a goodwill ambassador named Herbie Hancock. Oh. And uh, he's showing uh, a great example to everybody. Uh, what does it mean, intercultural dialogue? He's traveling all over the world and meeting all kinds of musicians mm -hmm. and creating albums with the musicians on the spot. Can I join? Yeah, okay. Oh, that okay. would be nice, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would make my day. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I, oh, yes, yes, I, I, will, I, will, I will tell him that. <laughs> okay. But I was just thinking, um, mm -hmm. one of your uh, journeys um, was Morocco. And it created, I don't know, I, I read about that it's not only an album, but it's also probably a film, or, uh, or it's only... Uh, no, it was a... So what, what, kind of, what kind of journeys are what has, have created, really, the, your credo? It's funny how one thing leads to another, because the idea yeah. of... I had been to Morocco, but only as a tourist, and I loved the place. And the idea of um, this album I made called One Eye to Morocco came from, an, it came from Poland. Right. I was sitting with a friend of mine, Tony... Uh, with, with an old friend of mine, not Tony, who um, recently died, and we were having we were having uh, lunch in a in a in the Jewish quarter in Krakow and in Schindler's Cafe, and he was telling me the background of this wonderful, <laughs> incredible story, and as he was telling me this, he was there were a, an incredibly beautiful woman walked behind him, and. I couldn't help it. My eyes <laughs> went off her and I followed her across the room with my eyes. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, what were you saying? And he said, ah, Ian, and he said, you have one eye to Morocco. Oh. And this is, <laughs> this is a saying in, in Poland, yeah. that if you lose concentration on the car, you have yeah. one eye drifting to Morocco. Yeah. I don't know why, but that's, I thought, because I was doing a different kind of album, it wasn't a rock album, it was, I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm taking my eye off the ball for now, so I'll call it one eye to Morocco. <laughs> You see, another very simple story. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really would like to thank you for joining us uh, also for just a couple of minutes and sharing your ideas and, and, and feelings and thoughts. Uh, just my last question would be, um, of course, we are all com committed uh, to culture diplomacy. And we were talking about that really music is a very strong tool for culture diplomacy because we can feel the same way, we can think the same way, so we can find the, the, the road yes, to each yes. other very easily. Mm -hmm. um, you are touring again. Oh, yes. And, <laughs> and really, throughout your tours today, yes. do you see a big difference compared to your tours in your you know, use? Are you talking about I am talking about the change of the world or the state of the world. Well, actually, as a performer, uh, not really. The people are 
you know, it's the same procedure. They come, they know the songs, they clap, they sing, they shout, they go crazy. And um, I think people are still free in that sense. You know, when they come to see a concert and come to see their favorite band, they let their hair down. You know, so if that's, you know, what you were asking, then <laughs> that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Ian, what is your next uh, stop in your journey? Intimate or, as you said? Um, well, I'm, next stop, I'm, I've, I've got two months off for bad behavior, so I'm going home for Christmas. And uh, <laughs> then we're going to, let me see if I can remember, New Delhi, uh, Dubai, New Zealand, Australia, um, Jakarta, and uh, Singapore and Kathmandu. Uh, then we come back and start work on promoting and touring the new record. We've, we've made a new record. The thing is, these days, when we record, when we wrote a song, in the old, you were asking Marcia about the difference. The, there are some differences, not necessarily in the grand scheme of things, but some technical differences. When we wrote a song in the old days, we couldn't wait to perform it. Way before the record came out, we'd be impatient and we'd be finding, fine tuning it and giving the old show some new blood. You can't do that now. So we can't, in all these shows we're doing, our record's not out till April, so we can't perform any of these songs because within one hour, it'll be on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> and it will spoil the effect of releasing a new record. So there'll be no surprise and it'll be, you know, a handheld something or other from a concert, out of sync and out of time and, uh, but not out of tune. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to uh, finish this very short live uh, interview, I would say, with uh, one thought that actually today uh, we feel that we are totally interconnected yes. in the world. Yes. That is why I really believe in uh, multilateral diplomacy, because by today, you, uh, if you really want to make a change, you have to do it mm -hmm. with many, many uh, players. Yes. But you and you are very important influences for this togetherness, well, thank you because we are interconnected mm -hmm. also through your music. And I think this is a great experience for all of us. And this is something which is a great pleasure what you are giving us in the whole Thank world. You Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.